Have you ever wondered why your appliance always seems to go wrong just outside of the warranty period? When we see a failure starting to take place, we are going to see spikes. And just as it got to 5,000 rotations, a catastrophic failure took place and the actual selector switch was no longer working. Now, the one thing I'll ask you all to do is leave a comment on this video so manufacturers can see your opinion, because it does matter. Hi, welcome to How To Repair. Have you ever wondered why your appliance always seems to go wrong just outside of the warranty period? I have done a lot of videos on obsolescence in machines, but I've never ever had the capability of proving it scientifically before. I'm here with Victor from Gotac in Barcelona, who tests Gotac selector switches, and they've also allowed me to test other competitors' selector switches so we can see why they're failing. Now, Victor is the chief engineer at Gotac with regards testing these, and he has to test his own company's selector switches. This company manufactures selector switches, but they're using silver in the contact tips and on some of the production in the components like the bridge, the points, and other bits and pieces. I can't go into detail how they make them, uh, because that would be giving their trade secrets away. But Victor has allowed me to use his laboratory for the whole week while we do some testing, and I'm going to be bringing up these charts onto the screen. But first I want to show you how we're going to go about testing the items, and also showing you the graphing results as well. Also, there's an additional video to this, which will be showing you how these selector switches are made here at Gotac, and we'll be going through the injection molding plant, and also the factory, which contains many robots for the assembly, because it's a bit of choreography that goes on, and everyone is part of the chain, understanding how these things are put together. Okay, I'm here with Victor at the moment, and he's going through each of the machines, showing me how to operate it this week, and how to do the mechanical testing. This machine is just designed to do rotations on the actual two components and test things like the springs, the actual lubrication on the switch, the backlight casing, or basically all the functionality of a selector switch. And rather than having to sit here rotating it by hand and going one, two, three, four, this machine does it all for me. It rotates and counts the amount of revolutions. This switch has already done 2,868, and this allows us to test the switches mechanically. But that's not really where the main technology is. The main technology is in the graphing equipment, and uh, Victor, if you'd like to show me the graphing equipment, and then we can show them the ovens and how the whole testing procedure works. We're here in front of the oven heating simulator that tests the selector switches, exactly the same as the mechanical version, but it also tests the contacts under load and also in a uh, simulated situation where the switch will be located. The switches normally sit in the cavity between the oven and the outer casing or the hot plate, and this area can get very warm. We have seen temperatures in ovens get up to 100, 120 degrees, even when they have a cooling fan. So we have to simulate the heat that this is going to be working in to make sure everything is complying to the standards. Now, the contact switcher not only puts a load on the contacts between 16 amp and 25 amp, Victor, yeah? Um, it will also do exactly the same as the other machine, rotate the cam, and it will also be able to be set with the amount of load to be put onto the contacts. Now this switch is a 16 amp switch, am I correct with this? Yes? That's correct. Yeah, and we need to test this switch at a 16 amp load on the contacts, and the first 5,000 cycles will be at 150 degrees, although this casing is made of bakelite, and this is capable up to 200 degrees so we can set the variance for the program for this. We are also able to set the temperature range in the oven, as I said, and then we have the conductors here, which will show the measuring of temperature at the Pacific NTC sensor, which is attached to the terminal head. And when we see a failure starting to take place, we are going to see a graph that spikes. And when it starts spiking, this is when things start to get a little warm inside these switches and you end up, after a period of time, 
after the spike, a catastrophic failure on the connections, therefore not able to conduct electricity anymore. OK, now you've got an understanding of how selector switches and components are tested. Before I bring up the test results and the graphs to explain how they're failing, I'm going to be showing you some failed selector switches in the side of the screen here. But you need to get a good understanding of the way manufacturers purchase components when assembling machines. Now let's look at this from a manufacturer's perspective. An oven manufacturer is going to produce 100,000 ovens for the European market, where the law states he must give a guarantee for a minimum requirement of two years. He is then able to do some numbers before purchasing the components. Consumer statistics work very well for the manufacturers. On average in Europe and the UK, the average household uses a cooker once a day. Therefore, the manufacturer is able to understand some numbers that are needed. If a cooker is used once a day, that's 365 full rotations of the selector switch under load during a one-year period. Two-year guarantee, 730 full rotations required. If the manufacturer then doubles this number because he wants to build it so it lasts four to six years, he then has a number of 1,460 minimum requirement for his purchasing. You'll understand more about these numbers when we look at the graphs in a minute. Before companies became conglomerates with multiple different brands, it was the designers and engineers that did all the purchasing. They cared about producing a quality oven or cooker that would last a minimum of 10 to 20 years. Today this has completely changed. It is the accountants that are in charge of purchasing all the components that go into these ovens. They only care about the numbers. The accountant then will go out and source the components with the bare minimum requirements, maybe saving 50 cents on one individual component. But this adds up to a whopping 50,000 clear profit on his books. Now look at all the components that are in the oven. This is how bad the industry is getting. The reason I'm making these videos, by the way, is I've done a couple of recent videos on built-in obsolescence with regards heat pump tumble dryers and washing machines, and they are very popular, over a million views, and everyone is saying the same thing. Everybody is dissatisfied with the way that appliances are only lasting four to six years nowadays. Machines in the 70s, 80s and 90s were lasting somewhere in the region of 20 to 25 years. It is an absolute disgrace how manufacturers are building obsolescence into all these machines today. Now I've been fixing cookers for over 40 years and the one thing that I've noticed in this period of time is the spare parts are not lasting as long as they used to when I go out to customers' houses and replace them. This is not a problem with the part suppliers in the industry. This is a problem with the manufacturers forcing component manufacturers to make cheaper and cheaper components for them so they can profit from it. OK, let me explain what you're seeing on the screen and I'll be bringing up many different examples. On the left you have the Gotak switch. Now on the right you have the same switch by a different manufacturer. Both of these switches are tested in the same environment. The switch goes inside the oven, is set up on the rotary cam, and then NTC sensors are connected to two terminal connections. You will see also two additional lines on there showing the conductivity of the electricity. Now let me explain the difference in the two switches, although to you they look identical. The difference lies in the alloys that are used on the contacts. The contacts are the points that open and shut. You have the bridge and you also have where the spade connector joins the actual selector switch. If these switches are not made in the correct material, they do not conduct electricity correctly. Therefore, it creates heat. This heat can melt the plastic, cause damage to the actual contacts, and even the actual points themselves, because they're not using silver on the points, can cause the points to carbonize, creating more heat. The graphs themselves are explaining this clearly and decisively. The next graph is a good example of an intermittent fault. The switch did reasonably well. It managed to do 5,000 rotations while the oven was at 150 degrees, but then you can see that the variation between the blue and green line, which was the NTC sensors measuring the temperature on the contacts, started to become very great in the differential. 
and what actually happened, it stopped conducting electricity at approximately 8,000 cycles. It did recover after 50 to 60 rotations, but it failed three more times after that before the test was cancelled. The next two selector switch graphs are from a different continent, and I'm not even going to say where, I'm just going to let you guess. As you can see with this first selector switch, after approximately 2,000 rotations, things started not to look correct, and you can actually see that the temperature was increasing on the actual two contacts, and they kept rising and rising. And just as it got to 5,000 rotations, a catastrophic failure took place, and the actual selector switch was no longer working. This last graph really does show poor quality and basically we have a copy of a Gotak switch here on the screen and this switch failed at 3980 rotations but it could have failed at any point earlier than that. If you look at the graph you can actually see that the temperatures on the contacts were in excess of 200 degrees as little as a thousand rotations into the cycle. This didn't even meet the quality control which is governing this industry. This is just a prime example of poor build quality when it comes to some components today. And there we go. Now the one thing I'll ask you all to do before you leave is leave a comment on this video so manufacturers can see your opinion because it does matter. There is too much greenwashing happening in this industry and not enough concentration on building reliable sustainable machines to last. Thank you very much indeed for watching the video. Please remember to give it the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you like, and remember you can all support the website by buying the parts off us. Thanks again for watching.